the Charter of the United Nations established a trusteeship system in order to replace the mandate system. Additionally, Article 73 of the UN Charter confirmed and expanded the concept of the sacred trust to all, I quote, territories whose peoples have not yet attained full measure of self-government, end of quote. In other words, to the colonies of the victorious European powers. And furthermore, the UN Charter referred to the self-determination of peoples in Article 1, Paragraph 2, and also in Article 55. Which peoples were envisaged to have such self-determination right, and what that right precisely meant, was not very clear at the time the Charter was negotiated. However, because the drafters of the Charter included representatives of the United Kingdom and of France, two powers with huge colonial empires at the end of the Second World War, because of that it is quite unlikely that they envisaged to bestow to their colonies with more benefits than the ones envisaged under Article 73. When referring to the self-determination of peoples in the context of the development of friendly relations among nations in Article 1 and 55, the drafters of the UN Charter probably had in mind the need to respect the fact that there were already deep political differences between Soviet-style democracies and liberal democracies. However, those provisions did not stabilize European colonies around the world. After the great sacrifices imposed on them by the war, peoples in the colonies were longing for freedom and for self-government. India became independent in 1947. Ghana was the first African country to reach independence ten years later. And in the meantime, both in Asia and in Africa, bloody colonial conflicts arose, notably in Indochina and Algeria. The fight against colonialism, which was first and foremost, of course, a moral imperative and a lifelong political struggle for many around the globe, gradually became a legal obligation. And the landmark development in that regard, in that legal evolution, was a short 15 years after the UN Charter was concluded, was the adoption by the General Assembly of the UN of Resolution 1514 on 14 December 1960. The resolution is entitled Declaration on the Granting of Independence to Colonial Countries and Peoples. And you will find the text of the declaration in the next reading. In substance, it proclaimed the, I quote, necessity of bringing to a speedy and unconditional end colonialism in all its forms and manifestations. Peoples living in non-self-governing territories and peoples subject to alien subjugation, domination and exploitation were granted the right to self-determination, that is the right to freely determine their political status, including attaining complete independence by becoming states. Self-determination of peoples acquired a new external dimension to the benefit of a certain category of peoples. Having the right to become independent, the colonial peoples were thus granted a form of legal personality. And the paradox of the right to self-determination bestowed upon those peoples is that its single use results in the birth of states. And once the state is born, the people somehow disappears or at least has exhausted its right to self-determination by realizing it. Ten years after Resolution 1514, the General Assembly reaffirmed the right of peoples to self-determination in the, I quote, Declaration on Principles of International Law Concerning Friendly Relations and Cooperation Among States, Resolution 2625 of October 1970. Interpreting the sacred trust of civilization under Article 22 of the League of Nations Covenant, half a century later, the International Court of Justice concluded in, it, in its advisory opinion on the legal consequences of the continued presence of South Africa in Namibia. The court concluded that, I quote, 
The ultimate objective of the sacred trust was the self-determination and independence of the peoples concerned." End of quote. The right of peoples to self-determination, understood as the right of colonial peoples to secede from the colonial power and become an independent state, that right brought about a revolutionary change in the composition and the concerns of the international community. In 1950, there were 60 UN member states. In 1961, after Re Resolution 1514 was adopted, there were 104. In 1970, there were 127. In other words, the international community of states more than doubled within 20 years, and the numbers continued to increase. No doubt, the outlawry of colonialism through the right of colonial peoples and peoples under alien domination to become independent, that right is now a fundamental principle of international law. And it might seem self-evident today, but one has nevertheless to measure the incredible change it brought about. For many generations in Europe, colonialism had been considered a noble task and a lifelong project, and it was now radically prohibited and today it is simply unthinkable. On two occasions, the International Court of Justice made clear that the right of peoples to self-determination is now a right erga omnes. We shall see later in the course what it means for a right or for an obligation to be erga omnes. But suffice it to say for the moment that it must be respected by all and it entails the right of all states to request its respect. In other words, if a colonial power were to refuse to grant independence to the people under its domination, it would not only be a violation of international law vis-à-vis -vis the colonial people at stake, but also vis-à-vis -vis all the other states and peoples. In the following, uh, following sequence, we'll turn to a question that certainly uh, has crossed your mind. Are colonial peoples and the peoples under alien subjugation, domination and exploitations, are those people the only people to have the right to self-determination, understood as the right, the entitlement to secede and to become a new state? Or are other peoples endowed with the same right.